Lockheed AH-56 Cheyenne was supposed to be an attack helicopter for the United States Army, developed all the way back in the 1960s. It's a curious design with an interesting tail-mounted thrusting propeller on top of the more traditional rotors, but for many reasons, the program never really came to fruition. Ten prototypes were built, but the helicopter never entered production, being cancelled in 1972. Why didn't the aircraft see combat? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. Now you have to understand, this was still very much the early days of helicopter development. Prior to the Cheyenne, Every single armed helicopter that had entered service had only been modifications of existing helicopters. The first armed escort helicopters that entered the Vietnam War, for example, consisted of 15 UH-1A Iroquois, UEs, which had been modified with systems that allowed for mounted machine guns, grenade launchers, and rocket pods. Which is great, but these weren't designed as dedicated attack platforms. You're just modifying the UEs. And for a while, that, that, that continued, actually. In June of 1962, Bell did approach the Army with another proposal, which they called the D-255 Iroquois Warrior. This was meant to be a purpose-built attack helicopter, though even it was still based on the UH-1B airframe, as well as the dynamic components. In December that same year, Combat Development Command, CDC, drafted a qualitative material requirement, or QMR, for an interim commercial off-the-shelf COTS, or COTS, aircraft. This is considered somewhat of an attempt by Army officials to acquire an interim helicopter that could fulfill the armed escort role until they could figure out exactly what they really wanted in a dedicated attack platform. But the Secretary of the Army actually didn't approve of the interim approach and preferred them to push forward with a much more advanced, dedicated system. Based on that, the CDC established the Qualitative Material Development Objectives, QMDO, looking for a rotary wing aircraft with a 195 knot, 224 miles per hour, 361 kilometers per hour, cruise speed, a 220 knot, 250 miles per hour, 410 kilometers per hour, dash speed, as well as the capability to hover out of ground effect at 6,000 feet on a 95 degree day, 35 degrees Celsius. And they based the speed requirement off of the aircraft the helicopter was actually supposed to escort. This was conditionally approved pending review, and the Army was directed to determine whether or not any other helicopter could offer an improvement over the current performance of the UH-1Bs. So Army Material Command, AMC, conducted their own study to determine even if the development objectives were feasible at the time. They recommended that the competition be narrowed to only compound helicopters, as they felt that that was the only helicopter configuration available at that time that could even meet the requirements at all. A compound helicopter is a pretty vague term that just describes a helicopter that has an additional system for thrust typically including small stub fixed wings. Basically, it could kind of partially fly like a typical airplane would. The Army Material Command would also establish a program office for the Fire Support Aerial System, or FAS. On March 26, 1964, the Army Chief of Staff redesignated the FAS program as the Advanced Aerial Fire Support System, AAFSS. The development objectives document was approved in April of 1964, and on August 1st of that year, the Transportation, Research, and Engineering Command contacted 148 prospective contractors with a request for proposals. And they did receive several replies, which included submissions from Bell, Sikorsky, Convair, and Lockheed. The Army would later announce that both Lockheed and Sikorsky were the winners of the Project Definition Phase contracts, on February 19, 1965. But at the same time, it was decided that since regardless of which design they went with, this was gonna take a few years and they needed something better right now, they were gonna pursue an interim aircraft too, which would result in Bell's AH-1 Cobra, which the original Cobra was basically just a UE 
modified heavily to be a lot skinnier and carry more weapons. That's, that's really all the original Cobra was, but they worked well for the time. Lockheed and Sikorsky developed both their respective proposals. Though eventually, the army decided that the Lockheed proposal would probably be cheaper and easier to develop. So they won out. On March 23rd, 1966, Lockheed received an engineering and development contract for 10 prototypes, designated the aircraft AH-56A. The deadline for operating capability was planned for 1972, and they had a pretty optimistic target of late 1970 for the aircrafts to really be ready. Construction began almost immediately, and on May 3rd, 1967, Lockheed held a rollout ceremony for the first AH-56A. The Army designated it Cheyenne. And the aircraft would first fly on September 21st, 1967. The Secretary of Defense would later approve pre-production funding to support an initial production order of 375 aircraft on January 8th, 1968. All ten prototypes were built and completed by 1969. And an overall design of the Cheyenne is pretty friggin' weird, and it kinda wound up looking a bit like a wasp, if you ask me. Its main features include a rigid main rotor, low-mounted wings, as well as that pusher propeller. It was powered by a General Electric T-64 turboshaft engine. At high speeds, the amount of lift provided by the wings was sufficient enough to reduce the aerodynamic loading on the main rotor to the point that it was only providing about 20% of the lift. The rest was being handled by those wings, and that amount could be adjusted by collective pitch control changes. The Cheyenne could hit speeds up to 230 miles per hour, but because it was a compound, it never qualified for speed records in helicopter categories since it was kind of cheating. Similar to the vast majority of modern attack helicopter platforms, the Cheyenne had a two-seat tandem cockpit featuring an advanced navigation and fire control suite. The pilot sat in the rear and the gunner in the front. And a weird thing about the Cheyenne's gunner spot is that the whole thing actually rotated to keep the gunner facing the same direction as the turret. Most attack helicopters don't, don't do that, but the Cheyenne did. Flight testing began in September of 1967, but rotor instability at low altitude and ground effect was noticed immediately. Adjustments were made to compensate for this, and a 13-minute demonstration for the public was held by the Army and Lockheed on December 12, 1967. The Cheyenne was able to demonstrate some of her impressive capabilities, such as the fact that she could slow down or accelerate without pitching the nose up or down at all because of the pusher propeller. She could also pitch the nose down or up when she was just hovering without causing the aircraft to accelerate forwards or backwards. These were very unique traits for the helicopter at the time, but a major setback would occur on March 12, 1969 when the rotor of prototype number three wound up striking the fuselage and caused the aircraft to crash and kill the pilot, David A. Beale. The accident occurred on a test flight where Beale had been instructed to manipulate the controls to excite a 0.5p oscillation, what's known as a half-p hop, in the rotor. A half-p hop is a particular vibration that happens once per two main rotor revolutions with a P refers to the rotor's rotational speed. It was discovered that the pilot-induced oscillations had set up a resonant vibration that exceeded the rotor system's ability to compensate. The Army would issue a cure notice to Lockheed on April 10th, 1969, citing 11 different technical problems with the current prototypes, as well as unsatisfactory progress. That half-P hop vibration hadn't quite been solved at that point, and the aircraft always had a major issue with weight. It was just heavier than it was supposed to be. It exceeded the program requirements, and the Army wasn't happy about that. Lockheed proposed an improved flight control system, ICS, to reduce the rotor oscillations and steps for removing excess weight and addressing other minor issues in the production version. But the Army felt Lockheed's solutions would delay the program and increase costs, which, yeah, it's, that's usually what happens. They felt Lockheed simply could not meet the production timeline so they wound up canceling the AH-56 production contract on May 19, 1969. Now, that didn't mean development was over, because they did let them keep the development contract. 
That meant they could continue working on it and hopefully meet the requirements eventually, but it didn't necessarily guarantee the aircraft would enter production. Another setback happened in September of 1969. Prototype number 10 underwent wind tunnel testing at NASA Ames Research Center, looking into the half-P hop as well as drag issues, but the engineers responsible for the tests didn't actually realize that the fixed mounts used to secure the aircraft in the wind tunnel would, in fact, not allow the helicopter to move relative to the rotor, as it would in flight. Because of this, there wasn't any natural damping of the rotor pitching motion, and she was being remote controlled at the time, so there was no sensory feedback which only made the situation worse. During high-speed testing to replicate the half-P hop issue, the rotor oscillations quickly accelerated out of control again and struck the tail boom, resulting in number 10 also breaking up and crashing. Lockheed still pushed forward trying to figure out the Cheyenne's issues. As a precaution to the fact that they'd already had at least two accidents, number 9 was fitted with a downward firing ejection seat, just in case something would go wrong. She specifically would be used for all remaining envelope expansion flights. She also received an upgraded transmission and drivetrain, as well as a hinged rear canopy in place of the original sliding canopy. Prototype number 6 was utilized for weapons testing at Yuma Proving Ground, Arizona, which demonstrated the ability of the gunner and the pilot to accurately fire on separate targets on each side of the helicopter. And towards the end of 1970, the Army funded work on Tau missile guidance and night sighting systems. Number 6 and number 9 would both be tested at Yuma, in 1971 to determine if stability and control systems would be sufficient. Deficiencies were identified in lateral directional stability, uncommanded motion during maneuvering, high vibration, as well as poor directional control during sidewards flying. Following these tests, number 9 received an improved engine, as well as the planned production version of the ICS system. With those upgrades, number 9 actually surpassed the performance requirements. Though under certain conditions, stability and control didn't completely satisfy the test pilots. Lockheed had been working on ways to prevent unstable feedback from the gyro, and the solution was to relocate the thing from the top of the rotor head to below the transmission with flexible connections to the rotor. It worked and was installed on Cheyenne No. 7 in 1972, but just the previous year in 1971, there was severe increased political friction between both the Army and the Air Force. What does the Air Force have to do with any of this? They weren't involved in the development of the Cheyenne, and that's correct. But the reason why the Air Force was annoyed is that they felt the Army was trying to replace them in the Close Air Support Mission, CAS. It had been mandated in the Key West Agreement of 1948 that that was the Air Force's job, and they felt that the Cheyenne threatened it. The Department of Defense did conduct a study that wound up concluding that the Air Force's latest close air support program, known as AX, which resulted in the A-10 Thunderbolt, the Marine Corps' Harrier, as well as the Cheyenne, were all significantly different, to the point that they didn't constitute a duplication of capabilities, and I'd agree, those are all completely different aircraft and do completely different things. On October 22, 1971, the Senate Armed Services Subcommittee on Tactical Air Power conducted hearings to evaluate the close air support mission, as well as all the pending programs. It didn't go well for the Army, because General William W. Momyer of the Air Force cited very, very bad helicopter casualty statistics from Operation Lamson 719. In response to all this, the Army wound up convening a special task force under General Marks in January of 1972 to reevaluate their requirements for an attack helicopter. The purpose was to develop an updated and defensible material needs document. One the Air Force couldn't constantly poke holes in and annoy them about. The task force conducted flight evaluations of the Cheyenne along with two other industry alternatives, the Bell 309 King Cobra as well as the Sikorsky S67 Blackhawk. Tests showed that both Bell and Sikorsky's helicopters couldn't actually fulfill the Army's requirements. Another incident with the Cheyenne that was just nothing but bad luck, but made them look bad, was a weapons demonstration that happened for the Senate Armed Services Committee in early 1972. This was supposed to show off the Cheyenne's firepower and garner support, but the first Tau missile that was fired in the demonstration failed. 
and went straight into the ground. The second missile was fired and hit the target, and that was great, and even before this, 130 Tau missiles had been fired from the Cheyennes without any failures. But that first missile was linked directly to how people were viewing the Cheyenne, which was completely unfair because the failure had nothing to do with the Cheyenne, it was a fault with the missile not the helicopter. But in April of 1972, the Senate would publish its report on the close air support role. The report recommended funding the Air Force's AX program, the A-10, as well as limited procurement of the Harrier for the Marine Corps. The report didn't actually mention the Cheyenne by name, but it did offer a relatively passive recommendation for the Army to continue procurement of attack helicopters so long as their survivability could be improved. All this came to a head on August 9th, 1972. The Secretary of the Army cancelled the Cheyenne program entirely. They cited the helicopter's large size and inadequate night all-weather capability. The Cheyenne had also been developed with analog and mechanical weapons systems, and when they had been built, those were fine, but new digital systems were coming into the fold that were much more accurate, faster, and lighter. The unit costs per Cheyenne had also increased, and if they continued to develop it, incorporating newer avionics, that would probably go up even more. On August 17th, 1972, the Army would initiate a new Advanced Attack Helicopter program, called just that, Advanced Attack Helicopter, AAH. This would eventually lead to the AH-64 Apaches, which still serve today in upgraded form, they did wind up getting a very successful attack helicopter, but the Cheyenne never had a chance. And even after the cancellation, the Army did conduct an evaluation of Cheyenne No. 7, which had been equipped with a newer AMCS flight control system. The testing showed that the AMCS removed most of the remaining control issues. It improved stability, improved the handling, and decreased the pilot's overall workload. Cheyenne No. 7 was able to reach a speed of 247 miles per hour in level flight, and in a dive achieved an astonishing 282 miles per hour. This didn't cause the Army to reevaluate their position, though. Prototype No. 7 was the last Cheyenne to take to the skies, and the cancellation was very damaging for Lockheed's prospects. They would encounter the Cheyennes so they could establish themselves in the helicopter market, and that simply didn't happen. Fortunately, though, four of the ten prototypes did wind up surviving into preservation. Number two is on display at Fort Johnson, Louisiana. Number five is stored at the Army Aviation Museum at Fort Novacell, Alabama. Number six is on display at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And number seven is on display also at Fort Novacell. Many still think that the Army shouldn't have given up on the Cheyenne, and it's hard to judge. There were plenty of reasons against it. But there are plenty of reasons to argue for it. I guess it depends on how you view things. Do you think the Army should have continued spending money on the project? It might have turned out something pretty incredible, sure. But we also wound up with the Apache. And the Apache is also really good, so I mean... What do you want? And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267 Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Jack Carson for our videos, Lord Off 444, Iser for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Will Jack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, Dub Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Brainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Travis Alinsky, Jared Brussel, JBL Explorers, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mark Holding, G Wiz, Mr. Terrell, Hayden DeGrow, Metal for Life Guy, No, Kurt Forkham, Ohio Trucker 1, Mitchell Cole, Mr. Sleepy, Dr. Racer 78, AET Museum, Railroad Preserver 2000, Williard Conklin, Windy City Rails, DM Tribal Typhoon, Harry, Western Colorado History, Ryan Wehofer, Drew Debris, George Kenny, Murder Drones Doll, Kevin Wood, Liam Wright, Morris Hillman Productions, NJ 1969, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Hannah Bird, and of course, my dad. Till next time. This is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.